Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Road Roll Football Show. I am Patrick Darty, joined today by Mr. Denny Carter, where training camp is raging. The preseason is raging. Brandon Ayuk has been traded for the third time, maybe <laughs> this time for real, uh, after false starts to the Browns and Patriots. Now appears he could be on his way to the Steelers. The emphasis on could be. A could deal be. is in place and has not been signed off on. We will lead the show with that. A lot to talk about coming out of the weekend and as practice is gone. We have injuries to Jameer Gibbs and J.J. McCarthy. We had an injury to Malik Neighbors that ended up not being serious. Thankfully, we don't have to talk about that. Uh, Tyrone Tracy air-casted at Giants practice on Tuesday. That shakes up the Giants' backfield in the zero RB landscape. Marquise Brown injured. That shakes up the wide receiver three landscape. Makes Xavier Worthy more appealing. A Rasheed Rice gamble may be more appealing. Usage concerns with Tank Dell. Uh, the Jags wide receivers, the Bills wide receivers, not necessarily concerns. Um, Keenan Allen um, getting bigger. <laughs> getting bigger. Um, you know, and as dads, we can relate. We can. Uh, Keenan <laughs> Allen is large now. Uh, then there's, man, there's just so much going on. There's uh, the Packers backfield, the Broncos backfield, the Raiders backfield, the Chargers backfield. So many, so many backfields, Denny. Uh, but, uh, you know, Denny, I, uh, I didn't tell you I was going to bring this up, but, okay. um, good. I, how did you feel about, you know, it's NBC lore. It's, it's not supposed to be known publicly. Everyone knows though, that you've been green screened in to several big events over the years, including uh, two of the past three Super Bowls. No, excuse me. Three of the past three Super Bowls, actually. All three. We have this huge sound stage in Maryland where you're CGI'd into big events, how did you feel that this time that technology was used for someone far more famous and talented than us, Snoop Dogg? And it, that he was on the NBC, the Denny soundstage for the entirety of the games of the 33rd Olympiad. How do you feel about that? I was disappointed. Um, it, it came down to a decision between me or Snoop, and they went with Snoop. Um, I just think because he's, he, he's an older guy, you know, and, and slightly more people know him. So they, they went, and that's fair. I'm not mad. I'm not upset. People are saying, oh, are you upset? Are you mad? Are you crying? I said, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm fine. It's fine. But uh, yeah, I mean, we have to use that technology for everyone, not just me. So I'm okay. <laughs> That's true. The, the NBC higher ups will hear about that. We need more democratization of the green screen yeah. technology after it's taken from you. And, you know, Denny, surely a celebrity just can't come in off the street and instantly be better than us. And Snoop Dogg's instantly better. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, it's so it goes. Uh, yeah, well, we, we recently used the green screen technology to get Kyle to the Fantasy Football Expo. You know? so that, and I, and I, was, I was happy that we got to use that technology for that. I argued to the higher-ups, you know, Kyle's from there. He'll go there. You don't need to green screen him. He was there. 11 miles away. You don't need and, to green screen him into central Ohio. Um, we really should move on to the football. But then I just took too. did you see yesterday it was going viral on Twitter? They asked people, or X, excuse me, they asked people what Olympic event they thought they could like get a gold medal in if they began <laughs> training today. And I was thinking this morning, like, you know, the classic, like, like uh, you're in prison for the rest of your life, unless mm -hmm. you can begin to train and get a gold medal in this Olympic event. And obviously okay. the answer is just that we will be in prison for the rest of our lives. Yeah, no, we're dying there. Yeah. We can't even get in the top 2000 probably in any of these fields. Uh, but what discipline would you choose? If you, the only way to get out of jail is to become a gold medalist. <laughs> Um, and let's say even just a medalist, even a bronze medalist. Oh my uh, what, gosh! What, well, you know, you're asking. Start? Look, you're asking a 40 year old like what what he's going to do to get into the Olympics. I, I I don't I don't have that that sort of physical stamina anymore to to like to like train it for any of these real sports. So I'm going to go with a fake sport. I'm going to go with skateboarding. <laughs> that wasn't what I was expecting. Uh, I'm kidding, so. actually. No, skateboarding looks incredibly hard. But I did see like a 50 year old dude from the UK. Like I don't know what he won. He won something. He won one of the one of the medals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm like, yeah, you know, if he can do it, I I could probably do it. So I think most people are saying the shooting because I think with the idea being that anything oh. with repetition. But I mean, I feel like you have to have like 2010 vision for that. You have to like Ted Williams level vision probably. I think I would maybe just go with the horsies. Um, like, I, can teach, I can eat a horse to jump oh, over this gate, can't I? Uh, uh, no, you can't. I I read that the New York Times had a piece on that, and I was like, and I was like you, I was like, oh, right, just tell a horse jump, jump over the dang 
you know, whatever it is, you know, fence. And wow, it is way more. It turns out it's way more complicated than even that. that's hard. Even the horsey thing's hard. No, the horsey thing is hard. By the way, obviously, you're right. The answer is shooting. You don't have to be an athlete. I I have good vision. I mm -hmm. can do. I don't have glasses either. Yeah, I think I'm going with the horsies. Of course, I've never ridden a horse in my entire life. I'm sure that's easy to learn at age 37. And then <laughs> well, well, riding a horse is, is absolutely miserable. Like it is one of the worst experiences I've ever had. I've, I've ridden a horse twice. I I I choose to never do that again. It's the worst. I'm sure it's fine for someone who has lifelong back problems like I'm me. I'm sure. sure it'd just be great to bounce up and down on that horse and then jump over gates that are there yeah. for some reason. I, I, it's the thing. I don't believe anybody who's like, oh, I really enjoy it. No, no nobody no. does. Nobody. <laughs> no one enjoys riding horses. No one is enjoying Brandon Ayuk potentially being traded to the Pittsburgh Steelers, least of all me, who is for some reason all in on George Pickens, an ultimate this time it counts player uh, with the Pittsburgh Steelers and Arthur Smith and – we know all about what Arthur Smith does to passing game options with limited quarterback play. Kind of a nightmare setup for both Pickens and Ayuk. Yeah. If Pickens, excuse me, if Ayuk ends up in Pittsburgh, as you pointed out to me before the show, of course, extremely good news for Debo Samuel and George Kittle in San Francisco, even with the first round receiver and Ricky Pearsall left behind. This trade is not official. And we, we've been lucid with the football many, many times with Brandon Ayuk trades this summer. Let's talk as if the trade is official. And just begin, what would the fallout be uh, for the pass catchers who are left behind in San Francisco? I would be very, very into Debo Samuel. If you look at the splits for both Kittle and Samuel, when Ayuk is 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 there or limited, or, I'm sorry, not playing or limited, um, they are quite good. And and you you take away one of the of these main, three main pass catchers from this offense, and the other two benefit tremendously. So. You know, in times where Debo has been out, Ayuk and Kittle have gone off. So it, it, I don't think it really matters which guy you take out. The other two are gonna, are, they're gonna eat. This is what the Zoomers are saying. So you have you have a, a, a Debo Samuel um, going as I should have looked this up beforehand, but he's That's going as now right yeah. right after Nico Collins, Mike Evans, Drake London. I, I would take Debo if, if in this scenario where Ayuk goes to Pittsburgh. I'm taking Debo above all those guys, maybe even over Chris Olave at wide receiver 11. I mean, any concerns about Debo and the injury history where is the counter take just might be, does Debo's like competition even matter? And is Debo just more competing against his own body? Because even with Ayuk there, I mean, Debo has remained on the wide receiver one, two borderline. Uh, I guess you're saying he shoots up more to mid range wide receiver one, yeah. but uh, could you make an argument uh, you did not make this argument, but could you make an argument to make Debo's surroundings don't even matter? And it's just about Debo, such a unique, specialized player. Maybe mm -hmm. the impact won't be as big as we think, uh, but you do maybe, think it will be. maybe. But you know, they, they without Ayuk, they I think they would move him around more. Um, he still does get some backfield work, uh, which is interesting. They, they 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 really do see him as like a bulldozer in short yardage and in perhaps red zone situations. Not as much as before Christian McCaffrey came to San Francisco, but still there's some, there is a little bit there a little bit of meat on that bone. Uh, so I think you mix that with a larger target share in a, in a Niners offense that you know obviously this is Kyle Shanahan, so we're never going to air it out here. Um, but that would be too easy. No, be uh, but, too easy. But, and <laughs> Kyle Shanahan wants to make things as difficult as possible. Uh, but but really, I do think that with Purdy having another year as starter under his belt, or at least, you know, one year under as starter under his belt, that this could be a slightly more pass heavy San Francisco offense. And that would be awesome for a guy like Debo. So what about the first round receiver, Ricky Pearsall, who has just been ignored more than almost any first round receiver I could ever think of. Brian Thomas also being largely ignored in Jacksonville, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Ricky Pearsall, this is underdog, the hardcore platform. Of course, he's a wide receiver, 67. Yeah. I mean, would Ricky Pearsall say crack the top fifty? Yeah, Brandon Ayuk is indeed traded to Pittsburgh. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a Ricky Pearsall guy at all. Um, I don't no, really we, get we, it. we know he's not good. I mean, it's fine, but that, that is, a lot of people but, aren't good. Yeah, but he team. would, he would be in there. Like he would get playing time, obviously. And I, and I, you can't help but think that because these, you know, Brandon Ayuk contract issues stretch back to like 1998. So you know, they, they, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> before many more. 
many, many different eras of American history. Yeah, and <laughs> oh, yeah, before he was even born, it was wild, yeah, which is incredible. Um, but yeah, I mean, so you have to think that the Niners during the draft were like, okay, like, we have to, we have to hedge on this Ayuk thing. And so they got Pierce Saul. They probably reached for him. Whatever he's on the roster, I, I think he could be somewhat interesting. I'm still not in on him, but like you know, he's going. You know, an underdog. He's going as what wide receiver? Oh, you're you're on mute. Excuse me, uh, wide receiver 67 for Mr. Richard Pierce. Okay, so it's the same with redraft. Um, so yeah, I mean, he but he would he would get up there. His ADP would get up there probably into like the wide receiver like 45 range. I'm guessing if IU goes to Pittsburgh. So, you know, you have to kind of take that for what it is, too. You said they possibly reached for him. I would editorialize, too. They certainly reached for him. Um, the big, big problem, people like people like me, we, we got we got George Pickens bags for days. Mm -hmm. the right. Bank examiner, he'd been taunting every time I walked in my mailbox. Like the <laughs> bank examiner's like, hey, buddy, just wait till I Yukins up in the Steel City. And he's, it's you know, he's, he's eyeing up my garage. I have a large garage. You have a very large deck. It's the Midwest. You have to have a large garage. The bank examiner, like he had out like a uh, uh, what do you call it? what is it? the tape thing? Uh, tape tape measure. measure. Tape measure. He's been walking around my garage with the tape measure. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what he's playing. You know, with. you have. I, I I would ask the bank examiner at this point. Does he ever go home to his family? <laughs> no, he doesn't at you all. You know, when does he? Because this is his big score. This is once he knows he takes me down. <laughs> he's set for life. So he's willing to give away. He's willing to miss a year or two of his kids' oh, life man. and take me down. And he's just he's sitting in his car refreshing Ian Rappaport's yes, uh, account so, over and over and over again. So, so uh, George uh, Pickens, wide receiver 29. Any chance in hell of that happening if Randy <laughs> is a Pittsburgh Steelers? Is he dude. really a wide receiver 29? I mean, yeah, he's been falling. That's been falling. I think probably because of IU panic. Yeah, but. yeah. I mean, he's going like T. Higgins, uh, Tank Dell range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's not palatable, actually. You know, look, he's still he's still going to have boom weeks. Okay, he's that sort of receiver. So while he's going, yes, to be frustrating to some extent in this very balanced and or extremely pass heavy P uh, Pittsburgh offense, I think that he can still uh, meet his ADP or even exceed it with with some boom weeks. Um, but really, Pat, like um, fantasy wise. Uh, this stinks. Uh, for it's, for it's a it's a it's a nightmare. It's a calamity for, all around. We're like everyone loses value. Yeah, Ayuk. I mean, like Ayuk's very good. I don't know if he's elite outside of the um, you know button pushing 49ers offense, uh, especially in a, in a in a Arthur Smith offense. But I I do I do think that you have to be very careful about where you take Ayuk and Pickens. I honestly like. Just my 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 initial take is I'm not interested in either. If Brandon Ayuk is currently the wide receiver 19, let's start here. He's traded to Pittsburgh. Would you rather have Brandon Ayuk or the wide receiver 27, Amari Cooper? Yeah, I I, I mean Cooper. <laughs> T. Higgins seemed like probably a no brainer over Ayuk at that point. Probably, yeah. I mean uh, the Higgins constant injury thing gets me, but I'm. Trying to remember that injuries are not sticky, no, or, no, 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 or no, so, so the bad. doctors tell me. So yeah, the are. doctors tell me they are. Yeah, I'm, I'm always at the doctor, and the doctor always telling me it's just random. <laughs> <laughs> no, I swear, I swear to God, it's random. There's no rhyme or reason why the same guys are always hurt. It's <laughs> we digress. Uh, we'll move on. We'll have a lot more to talk about with Brandon Ayuk. It'll be one of the topics of the summer if and when this trade goes down. Jameer Gibbs. Has turned into one of the topics of the summer. Actually, this is not a joke. Got in a heated, like, uh, in real life argument with Kyle Dvorak about uh, Jameer Gibbs on Sunday. Really? <laughs> Walking back from like, you know, heated is strong, but uh, we were strongly debating sure. Jameer Gibbs. Right? I was kind of more on the pro side of Jameer Gibbs uh, late in the first round. Kyle, I'll be, I hate to admit it, Kyle won the argument because I got home and I was like, yes, Kyle is actually right about Jameer Gibbs. And I published my article on what I considered the most fateful, quote unquote, ADPs of each of the first eight rounds. I chose Jameer Gibbs for the first round, and I just kind of went to the bust side. And this was before he suffered a mm -hmm. hamstring injury on Monday night. But right now, on August 13th, it does not seem like something is likely to hold him out for week one. Uh, but it's the second hamstring injury of the summer. You know, a guy who didn't need any variables with David Montgomery still there. 
what do you make of Jameer Gibbs' overall outlook mm-hmm. and concern with the hamstring injury? I, you know, look, if you if you can, you know, read some reports or some doctor takes on the severity of this hamstring injury and you feel confident that Gibbs is going to be back, if not for week one, then soon thereafter, then go for it because his ADP is about to drop maybe significantly. Um, yeah, I think so. He's been like know, late first round and I, I mean – it, you know that that little that little Q mark by his name in yeah, in yeah. in draft uh, boards Joker. and Joker. Uh, and then you click on the on the news item and it says he suffered a hamstring injury and you know it, it, it seems to not be just a regular old hamstring it might be fairly serious I I think you could see him in some leagues drop to the third round and at that point I think I'd have to take a bite at that apple once in a while. At that point, he is more properly priced. And he, he is, I do think he's kind of just priced at his absolute ceiling right now. Or I was arguing with Kyle. You know, Kyle was making the point, like, David Montgomery, uh, you know, he never surpassed David Montgomery as the primary goal line back. My take at the time was, like, I mean, it's a big deal he got any goal line carries. Like, I looked at it mm-hmm. more from the perspective, like, I actually, I think it's bad for David Montgomery that he allowed Jameer Gibbs to crack that door open. Right. Uh, but then as the, we – the heat died down and I was not trying to win an argument anymore. So yeah, you know, that actually is kind of bad. And uh, he was, I always forget how disappointingly inefficient he was as a pass catcher last year. He was, which I did mention in his pre-draft write up in the road to world draft guide. And that he only scored one receiving touchdown, uh, you know, kind of have a few injury issues. And so I think he is overpriced as a late first round pick, but like you said, if he tumbles into the third, then the risk reward yeah, it's much more in line with his ADP, and it kind of becomes a smash in the third. Famous last words on injured players in the summer. Yeah, but yeah, I would be into that for sure. You know, I, when I think about these Lions running backs, and of course, you know, Montgomery would would be like an elite fantasy option if Gibbs is out here, uh, if only for a little while. Um, I think about that pass catching element because. They they weren't super involved in the past game last year, and I know that sounds surprising for folks who may have watched them in in high profile games. Um, but really, I mean, you look at the overall running back target share last year. Uh, it was what was it? I'm sorry. It was it ranked uh, 16th. They ranked 16th in our, in running back target share last year, um, and and it actually dropped as the season went on. So. You know the fact that they have to split that that you know uh, route running role to an extent. Although Gibbs would be like the one A in those situations, uh, it makes me a little hesitant to go. It it has over the past six weeks or whatever made me hesitant to go in on Gibbs as a first or second round pick. Yeah, I think we arrived at the same point there. We're basically he has to remain super explosive as a runner. Like the yards per carry has to be over five. He has to get more efficient as a pass catcher, and he has to remain just ridiculously efficient in the red zone, where he yeah. he did he cashed in like all of his goal line opportunities yes. and short yardage opportunities, where he was like kind of unsustainably hot in that department last year. Jameer Gibbs, man, you're you're right about that. I I actually had forgotten how how hot he ran uh uh in you know goal to go situations. He had oh he had eight carries inside the five, uh. Five like touchdowns. All of them touchdowns. Yeah. Five yeah, touchdowns was... on the on those eight carries. Montgomery had um, seventeen carries inside the five. Had nine touchdowns. Pretty good. Um, too. But the opportunity split was obviously in favor of Montgomery to to a to kind of a wild extent. So Brandon Ayuk trade creates more uncertainty. A Jameer Gibbs injury creates more uncertainty. JJ McCarthy, unfortunately, tearing his meniscus. You know, a very divisive player. A player I'm like not a bit like super excited to see take the field because it's just really interesting when there's a wide range of potential outcomes and a wide range of opinions on a player. Uh, he's hurt and now is officially out of the running for the week one job. Yeah. Even if he's healthy by week one, he's not overtaking Sam Darnold at this point. So we do have more certainty now with the Vikings offense where we at least know he's going to be delivering the ball for the first few games of the season. Uh, what does the injury to J.J. McCarthy do to like just shore up your opinion on Justin Jefferson does it make you maybe more excited to potentially take a flyer on someone like Jordan Addison or an injury case like TJ Hawkinson? What does uh, certainty in the Vikings quarterback situation do for you? Well, I, I think it was going to be Darnold anyway. Um, you know, that, that was the, 
you know, word out of camp from day one is that. It, but now too, though, like the leash is going to be longer too, though. Like we, we just know that like Darnold, like he doesn't have anything to worry about right now. Even if you no. thought it was going to be Darnold, like there's, there's no worry, Denny. So it, Denny, it's different. Yeah, it is different. It is a little different <laughs> because there's no way McCarthy's going to be ready for, for the season opener. And, um, and I guess, I guess really now what you have is a situation where, McCarthy, you know, obviously he's not going to play for the rest of the preseason, but if he had another preseason outing, like the one that he had this past week against the Raiders, he's probably in the running, you know, for that, for that job. So you're right. Darnold does have that, the the starting gig to start the season, probably a little bit of runway in case he struggles, but I, I'm, I'm, you know, look, I weirdly, I feel like I'm kind of a Darnold guy. I've turned into a Darnold guy. I don't know what happened. You have Kyle I've and been, I um, had things to say about it in the group text. Yeah, the group the, the, I did for the listeners. Our group chat, me and Pat and Kyle, it's not it's not friendly. You know, they these guys are beating me up over Darnold. <laughs> they're, they're they're making jokes about you know it's not it's not nice. Um, but uh, but yeah, I I I think Darnold can do what needs to be done. I think that this this offense will be fairly pass heavy if not maybe you know maybe really pass heavy and i don't worry about justin jefferson at all you know getting him at the fifth or sixth pick you know that's pretty sweet i like that i've been taking justin jefferson a lot i'll say just because I'm, when i'm tie breaking between like you know the two and three running backs or jamar chase who's been kind of weirdly up and down he's always been a first he's always been first round worthy because we know hasn't been as much ceiling as we expected and you know a guy like tyreek hill He's coming off famous last words, a season he can't possibly match. I've been just taking Justin Jefferson a lot. I'm like, well, I'm just going to take the best skilled player in the NFL. That's just what I'm going to do. It's a tiebreaker. Um, I kind of forgot where I was going with this. Actually, <laughs> to be honest, but, but uh, what was the last thing you said before that? Um, well, no, I mean, I mean, just the the fact that Jefferson can not only survive with these guys, he can thrive. Yeah, yeah he can thrive. Yeah, I, I, mean, I had a really good point that I was going to make, and now I'm pivoting. To a different point where my concern with Darnold, the one good stretch of play we've ever seen was that stretch with the Panthers. And they were like as run heavy as any team in the 21st yeah. century during that. And yeah. that is not happening with Aaron Jones, Ty Chandler, and Kevin O'Connell. So like he's going to be like exposed. He's going to be out there, Sam Darnold. Like his arm, we're finding out once and for all. Uh, if, if it's there and I just do have my, notes. he's a talented thrower and by, by all accounts, every beat writer who's ever encountered him after his time in New York, which obviously was disastrous. And, and I don't really know exactly what happened there, but it was very bad. And, and uh, every, you know, both in Carolina and then in San Francisco last year, every beat writer is like, this guy has amazing arm talent. Again, the Minnesota beat writers this summer, amazing arm talent. So I think that that can translate. I, I think that there's a clear path to Donald being the starter all year, barring injury. Yeah, the real risk this turns into just a redshirt year for J.J. McCarthy. And I would argue he's the exact kind of prospect where you could not allow any doubt to creep in. And cause you had to really make a, a, a bull case in your head to use a top 12 pick on J.J. McCarthy. And say, yeah, say Sam Darnold is like, has a Baker Mayfield season where he's like clearly a top 20 quarterback then do you, can you automatically start J.J. McCarthy next year? And right. a, a very – one of the more ill-timed injuries that any player in the NFL could have suffered. This it's, summer, it I'm is saying. very tough. It, they, they were playing a very cagey uh, – talking about knee soreness and what, whatever, and, like, this is typical. Like, everybody has soreness. There was something going on behind the scenes, and the, the other shoe dropped, and it turns out to be a surgery situation, a torn meniscus. I'm going to be sitting up at night trying to remember what I was going to say earlier. You are. And you're going to come up with it at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. and you're going to text me. And I'm going to say, for the love of God, don't text me at this point. <laughs> that has not happened to me on the air in a while where I was like, oh, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. And then I was just talking. I'm like, uh, what? Not, not enough yeah. coffee, folks. Not enough coffee. Um, I was about to do a bad segue. Tyrone Tracy had been catching fantasy managers fancy this summer. Understandably so. Devin Singletary is one of the worst starters in the league. Eric Gray did not seize that job, that number two job as a rookie last year. Tyrone Tracy had better draft capital also than Eric Gray had. He's the new guy in town, which is what you want to be at running back a lot. Uh, but he suffered a very, very serious injury in Giants practice on Tuesday. Seemed like kind. They'll probably keep him out for the year or at least land him on injured reserve after final cuts and miss like half a season. 
And yeah, you you grimaced when I said Devin Singletary is one of the worst starters in the league. All I know is that he's going to keep getting away with it. Uh, what is your Devin Singletary take? Here, oh my God, that is he, he's I'm, horrible. What do you mean? What do you, come on, I am me? I am flabbergasted. I am taken oh. aback, appalled that you would suggest that Devin Singletary is bad. Devin Singletary isn't bad. He's actually good. Mm-hmm. Have you considered that? I am not. Actually, I did. I mean, I used to. I was used to defending Devin Singletary. I'm always the guy like, look, once Devin Singletary gets on the field, coaches don't take him off the field. They do right. everything in their power to not get him on the field right. to begin with. But then once they finally admit to themselves, like Thanksgiving, the Bills like. Uh, like last year in Houston, away. it was the same thing. They yeah. were like, I don't even know the Devin, whatever. He's the. Dam- he's, yeah, Damian. P- oh, oh, sorry. No, 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 no. They, they, they were like, oh, no, Damian Pierce is our guy. He's going to be catching 10 balls a game. He's going to get 35 carries a game. Damian Pierce ended up being the worst running back of the 21st century. So we, we gave Devin Sing and Devin Singletary did not let that role go. I look, this is a horrible injury and seems really bad. I wouldn't be surprised if he misses, uh, if Tyron Tracy misses the whole season. He, of course, stuffed the stat sheet, as Kyle said in his uh, preseason wrap up, uh, which, by the way, you all really do need to check it out. Kyle does a, a great job breaking down everything you need to know, uh, you know, for. <laughs> For folks who are not grinding every second of every preseason game, Kyle Kyle does it for you. So um, it's good stuff. Check it out on the site. Anyway, Tyron Tracy, really good preseason debut. It's over for him, obviously, after this injury. I think Singletary is just locked in to a volume-based role. And so if you make the bet on Singletary, I think you're, you're hoping that the, the Giants have some game script on their side, right? And that would mean yeah. Daniel Jones has to be they're better. Not, they're that, not going you know. to, by the way. But. <laughs> All right. Well, on to the next topic. <laughs> uh, it would be, you know, Malik Neighbors would have to be somewhat dominant, if not completely dominant. And um, and then Singletary could take advantage of that. I think the one caveat to that is that even if the Giants are really bad, and they probably will be really bad, if Singletary is out there as the pass catcher running the routes, he's he's going to be – not completely game script proof, but pretty close to it. As close to it as, as you can get, unless you're taking a guy in the first round. See, so yeah, with Tyrone Tracy out for a while, Devin Singletary has been going outside the top 100. He's currently the 113th pick. Yeah. You know, it's like round eight or nine or 10. I mean, eight yeah. is like the highest you'll see him go. Usually 10. I'm sure he's been falling to 11th or 12th, even, maybe not 12th in some drafts, but. Does he at least deserve to get into the top 100 now? Now that he doesn't have a young player kind of like nipping at his heels, I think so. And and he doesn't fit every uh, roster build, you no. know. And and I, I think that maybe that goes without saying, but I just wanted to say it in case folks are thinking that I'm suggesting that no matter what, you have to get Devin Singletary. It is don't you don't you sound dangerously close to that? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> RB 34 right now, like he's in like the Tajay Spears. He's in a really good range, a range that I like a lot. He's in the Javante, Brian Robinson, Tajay Spears, Ezekiel Elliott range. Um, and I, I, I like him there a lot. If, if you are starting your drafts with a bunch of really good receivers and maybe a tight end and maybe a quarterback and you're, and you're trying to sort of piece together a decent pair of running backs to start each week. Right. I think Singletary makes a lot of sense there. Now, if you took Breeze Hall or you, you, you took uh, Bijan Robinson or, you know, whoever else CMC, and then another guy in like the third or fourth round, another running back, you don't you don't have any interest in Singletary. Don't do that to yourself. You know, go go elsewhere in that range. So just keep that in mind as you draft. Yeah, he's a break glass in case of like touches emergency. Basically, yeah, you yeah. just need guaranteed touches on your bench. Uh, Devin Singletary is the way to go. This podcast will be the way to go when we come right back after this. The Roto World Draft Guide is here for you during the peak of draft season, and this year it has added features. Available exclusively through a new partnership with Matthew Berry's Fantasy Life. Get a Fantasy Life Plus subscription and receive the Roto-World Draft Guide to help you crush your competition. Use promo code ROTOWORLD10 for 10% off and unlock extensive fantasy, DFS, and betting tools now. Go to NBCSports.com slash Fantasy Life to learn more. Uh, What were we talking about? Football? We were talking about uh, the NFL preseason. You know, Danny, I feel like I've been adding... You know, the side comment, who's never been good a lot this summer. Uh, Marquise <laughs> Brown is a classic player who's just never been good. Oh, and yeah. Now he has a shoulder injury, highly questionable for week one. He actually could play week one. 
Uh, but the Chiefs were a receiver core. For, for a team that has the best quarterback on the planet, we had no idea what to do with any of their receivers because there is Marquise Brown. There's the first-round rookie, Xavier Worthy, who's a tad undersized, you may have heard. And Rasheed Rice, who we loved last year but is dealing with off-the-field uncertainty. A suspension could be coming. What do you think is the fallout of Hollywood Brown's shoulder injury? Yeah, I mean, you know, Marquise Brown had to go to the hospital uh, to get this shoulder injury checked out. I mean, it, it's a fairly serious one, and Andy Reid – was not going to play that game with reporters where he guesses when Brown never, will be available. The, he, the dude never says anything useful to reporters. Which, which makes him a good coach. I know. A good coach is lie all the time. I know. Like that's, you, if you're not lying, you're not trying. That's what I say. Um, and uh, anyway, Brown's not going to play week one. Let's just be real. Um, and that I think that means that Sky Moore slides into what? What? Here, 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 yeah, Tim, you can take that out. Yeah, three receiver sets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, Sky, the Sky Moore one. Yeah. Why is my mic still working? Did they cut my mic? <laughs> um, all right, sorry. Can, 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 you because look, Brown. I know it's uh, <laughs> it's it's very hard to keep a train of thought. <laughs> Brown, <laughs> Brown, Rice, and Xavier Worthy with a top three receivers while Travis Kelsey and Isaiah Pacheco play with the first team um, in this past preseason game against the Jaguars. Uh, I'm not going to get off track with a joke about Lewis, Lewis Reese Zamet. Uh, Down down horrific. So after, (laughs) after Brown left the game, Sky Moore slid into his spot. So I guess he'll be out there, but I'm look, this is not, this is not about Sky Moore. I don't care about Sky Moore. I'm sure he's a fine young man, but I don't care. Um, uh, this is, this is probably fantastic news for rice and probably for worthy, you know, and, and I, I, I think that they become more viable if you take Marquise Brown out of this offense, even for a short period. Uh, apparently the league has not interviewed Rasheed rice about his various legal situations in the off season. So I, I guess he, he's going to be playing this year. Um, so right yeah, in my Rice, faithful players article, I yeah. go with the line that I think he's going to play this year. Right. And so year, I mean. look, his, his ADP plummeted and then sort of stabilized. And then now uh, he's going as uh, like wide receiver 34, didn't he? 34, which, you know, he's going to finish inside the top 24 if he plays the whole season. So congrats to folks who uh, bought the dip on Rasheed Rice. So yeah, Rasheed Rice, he's a wide receiver 34. Oh wow, yeah, he's 34 on sleeper, 32 on underdog. So the, the creep upwards has began. I mean, this is probably a stupid question, but is Marquise Brown draftable? I'm assuming we're still drafting yeah. Marquise Brown. It doesn't seem like it's doesn't seem like an injured reserve situation. Uh, like you're gonna be pretty upset if you see Marquise Brown on your bench for two games injured. Like he's not the kind of guy I can't wait till Marquise Brown gets back. So right, you know. right. If um, if only I had Marquise yeah. Brown. No, but I guess I don't know. To draft him. I don't know. You're you're right. He's never been good. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, Xavier Worthy. He is too small. Obviously. Oh, stop! Come on, man. And and don't, don't stop. he could just by default see a lot of opportunity and make some cool plays. Make some big splash plays in this offense. I know there's this there's this idea I've heard you know batted around the football media ecosystem that Mahomes we talked about it and you're a big fan of this. Mahomes is back. Okay, he's, he's, he's never back. been more back. It's going to be Mahomes, vintage Mahomes, 2018, 2019 Mahomes. I, I think that that's predicated on defenses not playing. Mahomes as they played him over the past five years. And until that changes, Mahomes isn't back. I'm sorry. It's not happening. Well, that was uh, Marquise Brown may have never been great in the stat sheet or even as a deep threat, but defenses would have had to at least account for him. Yeah. And so it is bad that Marquise Brown could miss time. And you know, too, that now they just have to, they're not going to be running that offense, you know, probably the rest of the uh, training camp. Right. So it might be more of like the, conservative chiefs offense we saw last year and it's never been more over but yeah i mean you know mahomes is obviously still the best quarterback in the game blah 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 but uh, going over the top i just feel like that's just over i mean until the league yeah, until the league that. outlaws that sort of defense which they will eventually they will yeah, yeah. They, they're gonna have to uh they're that gonna. then you know look in the glorious future every team will be playing in a dome and there will be no two <sighs> high safeties no, 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 and it'll no, be no, great no. 
and everybody will be play, wearing flags. I'm gonna enjoy it. You're the only one, brother. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only one. I'm sure there's somebody else out there who would Domed like that. Green Bay flag football. It sounds like actual hell. We used to be a country. <laughs> we used to be a country. Uh, Denny, speaking of too small, Tank Dell. And, oh, uh, oh, come on, man. Um, and yeah, it, it's one preseason game, not that many reps, but kind of to no one's surprise, I would say he was the odd man out in three receiver sets in the very limited time the Texans' first team offense was on the field. Uh, how much do you want to read into that, if at all? I'm reading into it. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, as we probably need to. Yeah, yeah. He caught a touchdown, and and he obviously has a, a nice connection with C.J. Stroud, and demonstrated that a lot last year before his season-ending injury. Uh, and Stefan Diggs is there, and Stefan Diggs is chatting up C.J. Stroud at every opportunity on the sideline. Uh, uh, and I think that Diggs is going to, whether it's good for the team or not, I think he's going to be either the one A or the one B with with nico collins and he and they're going to be out on the field when it's two receivers right and not tank dell and that matters that matters um because you're talking about you know tank dell maybe only running 65 70 percent of the routes it doesn't mean that he's a disastrous fantasy pick but it makes me hedge yeah it's he's a guy who i feel like needed everything to go right this summer i do hesitate to read too much because it could have just been we're working on this package this game we're Maybe. working on and i'm expecting of course the tank dell nico collins and stefan diggs it stands the reason you're going to have mostly three receiver sets and that most of them should be out there at least like 70 80 percent of the time right maybe that's a little high but they're going to be out there a lot basically and like their standard offensive sets and but it just – why would you play Tank Dell in two receiver sets? And you've got the big guy, Nico Collins, and the everything guy, Steph Diggs. Uh, I, I just Unless Steph Diggs is in, like, irreversible physical decline, which is possible, uh, it just seems like Tank Dell – it makes too much sense for Tank Dell to be the odd man out, odd man out. And then the first, you know, opportunity we got to see it, he was indeed the odd man out. So it's concerning. So, uh, yeah, right. And I, I will say on, on Diggs – I mean, the, the fact that Tank Dell had this usage in the preseason opener, and we'll, we'll see what it is next time, you know, what, what the team says and whatnot. But that doesn't put me on Stefan Diggs, okay? Um, I'm not interested in, in him either. Why, why receiver 19? He's going, he's sandwiched between Cooper Cup and Jalen Waddle. I'm I'm taking those to Waddle and Cup 10 times out of 10 over, over Diggs. Uh, Pittman is right there. DJ Moore, D, DK Metcalf. This I love this range of receivers, um, and uh, Diggs is basically uh, invisible to me in that range right now. So I got him on the fateful ADPs list for the third round and sleeper. And see on underdog, he is currently also in the third round, about the same. And why I mean, these Texans ADPs? All I know is that one of them is going to be disastrous. Yes, like yes, disastrously what, right. Well, Dell Collins or Diggs. I don't. I don't know which. I think any of them could be. Really All three bad. of them could be. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. No. You're right. That is something I wanted to mention. They could all be really bad. I mean, for, as far as like the the ADP the draft, value goes, the draft capital you 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 invested into them. So I guess what you'd say is, if you think the CJ Stroud's going to have a big year, and but that the touchdowns and the yardage are going to be distributed between these three guys and Dalton Schultz, then take take Stroud and redraft, uh, you know, in best ball, we're stacking, we're doing all this fancy yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't have to worry about that. redraft. So Denny, you say that Xavier worthy is too small. You say that tank Dell is too small. And yet curiously, there's one receiver you say is now too large. And uh, <laughs> other people are legitimately saying that if Keenan Allen actually weighs 230 pounds, I think he'd be the third heaviest receiver in the NFL right now. Yeah. I saw. And yeah, a guy who's a slot receiver, a guy who's not known for like his explosive speed, who's known for his quickness, who is in his thirties. Like, why would he put that much weight on like a lower half that's had a lot of injury issues? It's like, what do you think's even going on here? And yeah. what do you make of it? it? It's one of the stranger reports we've seen in a while. Like, you know, like Keenan Allen's playing at two hundred thirty pounds right now. Albert Breer from Sports Illustrated said that 
uh, he kind of offhandedly said, you know, Keenan Allen's 230. Well, his Keenan Allen's 230 now. His, you know, listed playing weight is 210. You know, so we're talking a 20 pound difference is, is something. I saw some some film film grinders who watched all the Bears snaps, all the Bears starter snaps this past week against the Bills, and they said that Keenan Allen appeared very slow. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I, I believe it. And uh, Keenan, if you're listening, I get it. I get it, man. Like you're getting older. Uh, it doesn't really matter how much you exercise at, one, at some point. It's just the weight just it just doesn't go away. Trust me on this. But uh, you can watch what you eat. It doesn't matter. It's anyway, all diet. Uh, the, I, there, <laughs> just to get, get into it, it is. It does, exercise, obviously. Wait, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. I'm um, break. So, yeah. So, you know, he did have okay usage besides not being targeted uh, against the Bills. Keenan Allen ran every route with the starters. <laughs> DJ Moore was targeted on three of his five routes, so that's pretty good. Um, and then you had um, Ro- Roma, Dunze. Ro- Roma Dunze playing um, kind of more rotational. Uh, they, the, the Bears used three receivers on 66% of their starter snaps. That's actually not a lot. Uh, that would put them like in the bottom half or the or, you know midway point in the league. It's nothing like we see with like the Rams or the current Falcons, where you know they're playing three receivers ninety percent plus of the time. Um, so sixty six percent is not great. So if Keenan Allen is a slot guy, ah, uh, I'm regretting taking him in a recent fantasy industry draft um, because uh, didn't know that he was large and uh, didn't know that. Um, they were not going to play a lot of three receivers. So, nevertheless, nevertheless, man, you just don't you don't see a two hundred thirty pound slot receiver very often. I mean, maybe like these guys can lose weight pretty. Remember, remember every year we would be like, oh, like Leonard Fournette weighed in at two sixty five. Yes, and then he and then he would instantly be like, I'm going to lose thirty pounds in August. And he was he, right, and but... he would. So maybe we can get that with Keenan now. But if Keenan was two thirty, that would suggest to me then he like had an injury and couldn't practice over the summer. And that's also concerning. Like I know. there's really no I, great explanation for Keenan I, Allen. I will say, I will say th- this smoke, the snooze, whatever you want to call it, uh, makes me much more bullish on Roma Dunze, who is ascending, who is obviously much younger generations, younger than Keenan Allen. And uh, this offense, I think could be exciting. I mean, Wow. Like Caleb Williams looked like the real, real dang deal against the Bills. Rome, don't call me JSN Adunze. No, no, he's 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 working hard. Totally different skill sets, and yeah, I just meant that like a, a rookie coming into a crowded receiver core. Rome Adunze looks like he could avoid that fate, so that would be very, very nice. It would be very, very nice if you stay tuned in when we return right after this. Fantasy football season just got better, one million dollars better. Create or join a private Yahoo Fantasy League and enter the $1 million NBC sweepstakes, plus earn extra entries to win when players on your fantasy roster score a touchdown during an opening weekend game on NBC or Peacock. Download the redesigned Yahoo Fantasy app or go to NBCSports.com slash Fantasy Millionaire to learn more. I lost another thought. Uh, I'm telling hey, you, I had this are you school... Okay? Well, no, school started today. Oh, it did? Oh. I'm getting up at like the crack of friggin' dawn. Oh, again. no, I didn't know that. It's School started? Yeah, I know. I'm malfunctioning. I, I, I Supposedly it's a one-off for some weird schedule quirk oh. that we have. Yeah, it's absolutely brutal. I, I, I'm dying, though. When, when, did, when did the school end in March? What was it? Yeah, like May 22nd or something. It ends oh, okay. Here. Oh. Yeah, but I'm dying. Man, Back in my... my... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go. Back in my day, school started after a little something we like to call Labor Day. I did. I know. It actually never did for me. No? But no. Look, I've been caught, I'm in like the archdiocesan system. It's St. Louis. It's the St. Louis thing, man. Uh, well, we, we, yeah, Labor Day was still the summer, brother. Back exactly. Day. exactly. Yeah. Man, what the heck was I going to say? I'm so, so angry. I'm sure it was going to, it was going to turn the whole argument on its head. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried about you at this point. Denny, you're also worried you tell me about Christian Kirk. Yeah. Uh, you said Jover for Kirk after <laughs> checking out one quarter of a preseason game. <laughs> what has you concerned about Christian Kirk and the Jaguars wide receiver usage? Um, yeah, so it's happening again. 
Um, this happened last preseason. And look, I by the way, I take no pleasure in talking about Christian Kirk this way. I take I took him a lot in best ball. Like I'm I'm all about I'm gonna say the Christian Kirk life. I've never said that in my life. It's all about the Christian and life. I feel like I shouldn't, but yeah, Christian Kirk life, you know. Uh so he last summer he uh, didn't play in two receiver sets during the preseason. This is something Kyle mentions in his piece. Check it out on the site. Uh everyone panicked. Uh, it happened again this past week against the Chiefs. Gabe Davis and Brian Thomas, the rookie, both played better, all better. all nine snaps with the starters while Kirk got uh, two plays off. Um, if we remember all the way back to week one last season, Christian Kirk ran a, a route on 66% of the team's dropbacks and caught one of three targets for nine yards. Uh, if you want to know, I looked it up for the folks. If you want to know, how often did the Jaguars in 2023 run three receiver sets? They ran it 44% of the time, which ranked 22nd in the wow. NFL. That's really low. And, you know, so, hey, look, if Gabe Davis and Brian Thomas are on the outside and Christian Kirk is not, then Christian Kirk's ADP needs to drop a lot from where it is. Well, especially because, I mean, Evan Ingram's not coming off the field. And no. that's his primary competition for those targets. And I just don't know why. Why would you draft – or acquire those two like like mainstay outside wide receivers and then just abandon the middle of the field where everyone knows the easiest yeah, yardage, man. the easiest conversions come from. I, I'm but so we had the same point. problem last year, though. You're right. Why are, is Doug Peterson and his staff obsessed with this boundary thing? Right? Like like they got Brian Thomas. They got they got the two. They two got two guys who are special. Their specialty is 50 50 balls on the sideline. Right. And every other smart team in the league is attacking the middle of the field relentlessly with small receivers. The Jaguars need to get more small receivers, less giants on the outside. It doesn't work like that, especially when you have a quarterback. And I'm going to say it. They have a quarterback with limited arm strength. Oof. Yeah, no, no, that's it. Like totally unarguable. It's not even I would say not even a good arm. Right. I mean, I mean, subpar arm strength. Trevor Lawrence is not making those throws. He's just no. not. Now, I think Brian Thomas is good enough to, to make those work, right? Because that's just what he does. He's going to be way better than that uh, at that sort of 50 uh, 50 uh, ball than Calvin Ridley was, okay? Um, but I, I don't know. This, this Jacksonville offense is uh, kind of frightening me right now. I can't be the only one who thinks Trevor Lawrence would have had fewer drop passes last year if his receivers could make the greatest catch in NFL history. <laughs> <laughs> out of every four plays. God, I love that. I love that super clip of no. uh, of, no. of Ridley, uh, quote unquote, dropping like twelve <laughs> balls. And he's like it's twelve like, feet. He's like Simone Biles up in the well, air. Right. Well, <laughs> ten of those would have made the highlights for greatest catch of all time. <laughs> Just like the NFL Network countdown is like that. Greg Rosenthal talking about Calvin Ridley. Yeah, it is. Right, right. But it, but but for Jags fans, by the way, those counted as egregious drops, perfect throws <laughs> from our lovely, lovely quarterback. Denny, by the way, uh, what is the abbreviation for middle of the field? Moff. The Jaguars won't moff anyone. <sighs> you know, I'm really. I actually am shocked we're allowed to say that on the podcast. <laughs> I, it's a thing. No, I, I know. It just it, it sounds not good. The muffining. We we can't get any muffining going in Jacksonville. We need the muffining for Christian Kirk. We need something from this Bills receiver core where it's the rookie Keon Coleman, the free agent addition Curtis Samuel, the third year fifth rounder Khalil Shakir. It might not even matter who the number one receiver is. They might not ever have a number one receiver. What do we learn from the data? over the weekend as the Bills began to tip their hand with how they're going to deploy the receivers this year. Yeah, well, you have to remember um, – oh, man, his name escaped. Who's the who's the the big Bills receiver? Not Cam Coleman, but the other big one, big guy. Uh, uh, Marquez Valdez-Scantling? No, he played a lot, though. He played a lot. It's everybody uh, – the coach's favorite. Gosh darn it. Oh, I Mr. Matt Collins. Sorry. Matt Mr. Collins. So Matt Collins was out, so you have to take that into account. But, I mean, Coleman played every – ran every route, 100% route rate. I don't know if that's going to hold up if, when Hollins is healthy. I know that sounds funny, but Hollins is a favorite. That's what so. Joe Biscalia told us too. Like, man, listen, they they love Matt Collins. They, they love like him. They else. love him because he, he's a character. Um, 
Uh, my my main concern, I, I've been really heavy on Khalil Shakir in all formats. And uh, I did I did not like what I saw in this preseason opener against the Bears. Uh, Shakir and Curtis Samuel were only on the field together for one play with the starters. Shakir ran four of his five routes from the slot, while Curtis Samuel ran six of his nine routes from the slot. So... I mean, it kind of seems like we have a rotational slot situation between these two. And wow, that stinks. That's that's bad. I don't like that at all. I mean, Shakir, I like a lot. I like Curtis Samuel a lot. But if they're splitting, I'm, I'm out on both of them. With the only caveat that you kind of alluded to is that coaching staff aims can be kind of inscrutable during the preseason. Who knows what they're really trying to figure out, what they want to – there just might be certain situations they wanted, certain packages they wanted to see. And it might not actually mean anything, but once you do see something, you you just can't wish it away by saying, "Well, it might not mean anything," no. because it might mean something, and they showed it to us. And so, no, yeah, you're right. taking into account. I mean, yeah, are we over analyzing this? Yeah, of course, because we're talking about very small sample sizes. But guess what, folks? It's all we have to work with. Like it's we don't, we, got. we don't have anything else. To, we have tiny sample sizes, and we're trying to make something out of it. But I. I I, I like Shakir as a player, but playing time matters. Routes matter. And if he's running 50% of the routes, then he's not going to be fantasy viable. It's just, it, it's just that's it goes. The chief sinning of this offense continues. It's just, it's a role player offense. Oh, yeah, like, you're right. It's yeah. just going to be a role player offense. In, in the, uh, there's probably, uh, we, the, the, during the week, Tony, uh, Sean McDermott did not tell us MVS was going to be playing this much. I'll tell you that. <sighs> I, how, I, mean, I, was, I did my Romo voice for Nance on accident. No, you're right. Yeah, I, I know what you meant, though. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know, I know, I know what you meant. Uh, MBS, uh, it just it will never go away. No. Like he is so annoying. And I'm sorry, MBS, if you're listening, but uh, you're so annoying like, because uh, you, no one ever throws you the ball. You never even want the ball. You just run fast downfield and clear out space for whoever's catching the ball, and it. I'm just I'm I'm super super annoyed. By the way, Dalton Kincaid and Dawson Knox sort of split the starter snaps. They played some two tight end sets, but it wasn't anything catastrophic for for Kincaid. Anyway, we're we're running out of time. We got some more topics though, but I have to. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. I realized how I get the gold medal. I okay. Realized. I'm bribing my way onto the U.S. men's basketball team, and like like listen, man, you can just leave Jason Tatum at home. You're not playing him anyway. Like whatever, put me on the roster, put me in for one minute in like the final group stage game, and get me my gold medal so Bingo. I can get out of jail. Yeah. When when you uh, when, right when you don't uh, don't participate in the group tr- project and you get an A anyway. Exactly, Tyrese Halliburton's uh, instantly iconic tweet after Steph Curry's instantly iconic performance. Holy mackerel! Kyle Dvorak and I were jumping out of our seats. Denny was cowering under his desk when he saw Brock Bowers' horrible usage. Apparently, uh, mm-hmm. what did you think about Brock Bowers in his preseason debut? I mean, it actually is in the eye of the beholder because I, I don't I don't think that Kyle thinks it's bad. And I saw some other analysts who thought that it was horrible and then others who thought, well, this is actually the best possible usage. I, I don't know. Like, it just seems like a team that doesn't really know what they're doing. Um, what a surprise. So against the Vikings this past week, Brock Bowers played 12 of 14 snaps with the starters but only ran a route on five of 10 dropbacks. With, with the Raiders starters. So you got 50% route rate. That would not be good, as Kyle points out in this column. Um, so Bowers ran six routes. I'm sorry, he ran five routes, like I said. One from the slot, two out wide, two in line. Uh, they're just yeah, messing I, around. That, I mean, I, I could I say maybe it's not bad because they're just messing around and trying to see how they want to use them, maybe. That would be the, the positive take. You know, and... Uh, I've read enough about this Raiders team and defense to think that they could actually be really good on defense to the point where they can kind of create a lot of positive game scripts for the offense. And in that case, I think they're going to be, they're going to lean toward the run. Um, So that probably wouldn't be great for Bowers um, because Adams, (laughs) Devontae Adams is just going to be a target black hole. Like he always is. Um, And and then, and then, and then also, (laughs) And then also, uh, I think, it, you know, that sort of positive game script for the Raiders, if they do, in fact, have a good defense, could be great for a guy like Zamir White, who scored a touchdown yes, here. I was going to say, tell us about Zamir White. Yeah, scored a touchdown um, 
I, uh, I do have some notes and I, I missed them for a second. Yeah. Uh, he, he played on the Raiders first drive where he, um, did everything. He played everything except for two third downs. And also he came out on a second and 10. Um, he had six rushes for 23 yards and a touchdown. Uh, it's kind of what we thought, right? I mean, he, he's, He's not going to Alexander Madison appears to be the pass catching back. That's fine, whatever. Um, but but uh, but good game script for this team means probably a pretty heavy Zamir White workload. So he can make me look a little foolish, I think. Zamir White also in my faithful ADP's article where I said he could either be like a freebie RB2 starter or he could be a quote instant Alexander Madison. Um, right. And if things go sideways for this team, which definitely could happen, um, Samir White is going to have a tough, tough time getting weekly touches as the Raiders drop back and try to chase points. Denny, do you want to talk about your article or do you want to talk about these other backfields that we had some news notes um, on? Probably probably the backfields. Uh, just I just mentioned I, I wrote about boring running backs I'm targeting on uh, the Roto World site if folks want to check that out. Uh, so yeah, okay. Um, was one of them the Broncos or not? Uh, and yeah. what do you want to what do you want to tell people about the Broncos Broncos backfield where my GP Ryan is miss me yetting apparently and refusing <laughs> to go away. Refusing yeah, to go away. so uh, I don't think it should be a, too much of a shock, but Javante Williams started the game for the Broncos, um, played all of the snaps on the first two drives, uh, outside of of course passing situations, which is a little troubling where Samaje P. Ryan came in, took over for Javante in those um, dropback situations, those clear passing situations. So that's that's not great, I will say. Uh, it's kind of the way that they were treated for most of 2023. It wasn't until the fourth drive for the Broncos that Jaleel McLaughlin came in um, and then Audric Estime, the rookie, mixed in a, a, as well. So it looks like Sean Payton, for now, you know, he could change his mind. That's his right, his constitutional right. Um, it, that J Javante and P. Ryan are the co starter, not co starters. They're, they're the they're 1A and 1B, and then Julia McLaughlin and Estime are behind them. That, that's the way it looks. Man, that's, I, I just, I, all I know about the Broncos backfield, the one certainty is that I don't know what it's going to be, but there's going to be a rug pull. That's all I know. Yeah. There's, there's mm. going to be a rug pull of some sort. <laughs> Where there's, there's just like one red herring after another. Like, for all we know, he's just showcasing Javante Williams to the Cowboys. Like, have the Cowboys called yet? Have the Cowboys called yet? <laughs> Please tell me Jerry Jones has called. <laughs> like, sorry, he hasn't called yet, Sean. He's like, oh, my God, when's he going to call? He, he swore to God he was going to call. Great. Right. Yeah. Sean Payton is asking his assistant coaches to call his phone to make sure it's working. <laughs> 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 again you just kind of do the brand new phone sean um, <laughs> we did this we 90 know, minutes ago sean yeah, we know it's working um we know that it's over for kamani vidal um, <laughs> it couldn't be more over he was the guy we talked about a lot talked about a lot in the spring but it looks like he's behind Jarrett and Jarrett patterson a, a member of the commander's hall of fame admittedly Jarrett patterson but uh it's never been more over for kamani vidal question mark denny God, yeah, no, it's uh, I mean, it's God, it's it's he'll go down as a fantasy football hype legend, and I was fully in, you know, so it's my fault. I was, I was too, not a bit. I was too. I mean, it made sense, the dot connecting made sense. He was a massive workhorse in college, and this team's gonna be run heavy. And Gus Edwards is always hurt, and JK Dobbins has had catastrophic injuries back to back, so. Uh, it made sense, but uh, it no longer makes sense. So you got to stop drafting Kamani Vidal and um, start drafting J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards, I guess. Although I'm not exactly excited about those two anyway. No, I I cannot believe it. But I have I've started eyeing up J.K. Dobbins in a lot yeah. of drafts. I came away with him, even one of my Kings Classic leagues, and I mean it could could be worse. We if, if we we know that whoever's the number one back is going to have some value. We don't really know how big the role will be. Yeah. I just feel like signs are pointing to J.K. Dobbins, which I don't know how I don't know how you even remain in the league after you've torn your Achilles and your ACL. I don't know. Like he's remaining in the league and supposedly like looks totally fine after tearing his Achilles. 
Like everyone's like everyone's now saying like you're actually healthier after you tear your Achilles than before. Oh my gosh. I just have a hard time believing that, but yeah, I've heard I have heard that uh it's no big deal anymore. No big deal. Final note, Marshawn Lloyd hamstring injury, supposedly not serious. Does this do anything for Josh Jacobs, etc.? No, I don't think it does much for him. I think Josh Jacobs was galaxies ahead of Marshawn Lloyd anyway. Um I, I think that you know Lloyd struggles and the now the injury obviously it's not like super you know long term but i think that he has a chance to start the season as the rb3 behind aj dillon he probably was already going to do that um according to jason hershorn from the leap who talked to us a couple weeks ago about the packers offense and uh so i I do think it's it's jacobs dillon and then a, a long way and then you got lloyd and uh emmanuel wilson who looked good in the uh in the preseason opener Speaking of Jason Hershorn from The Leap in our team preview series Thursday, we're going to have the New York Daily News' Pat Leonard, um, CS, or excuse me, not CSN anymore, NBC Sports Washington's um, J.P. Finley. They're going to help us break down the Commanders, Giants, and the entire NFC East. So be sure to tune in for that. And, yeah, check out our articles. I have an article uh, called The Fateful Eight. It's a good um, piece. About, thank you very much. On, I think, like, yeah, the, the ADPs in each of the first – eight rounds with like the highest variance, like the widest range of outcomes. And of course many players have a wide range of outcomes, but just who I think is like the most faithful player in each of the first eight rounds. And tell people about your boring running backs piece. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So last year I, you know, I kind of had a, uh, I'm going to use a, a very old phrase. Uh, don't, don't take a sip of your coffee right now. Uh, it's a, uh, I had a bee in my bonnet. I like it. I <laughs> so like that I, one. I, I am. I am. I'm appealing to the Zoomers with that one. You wear and a bonnet. I do. And uh, the B was in the, my bonnet. And the, 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 the B was really that uh, that the best running backs are going to rise to the top of their backfields. And that is not true and has never been true. Um, and I was I was basically tired of pretending that it, that that is is a, a, a truism. Like that's not that's not the way it works in the real world. It doesn't matter if a running back is good. It doesn't. No. It, it, the coach determines who gets playing time. So I, I identified some boring guys, including Devin Singletary, Pat's favorite running back. Uh, uh, I used who, to be accused of being a Devin Singletary apologist. I remember. By the way. I remember. And and you know, guys who are just just kind of boring. You look at their ADPs, you look at them, and, ah, whatever. But I think they can be exciting because of opportunity, because of workload, because of backfield situations. So check that out. Check that out. Check out Galaxy Brains live on the site where we give you three of the biggest storylines in oh. the preseason. And another Galaxy Brains later this week that we've definitely planned already. We we have an in the can, folks. We've no, been we've in tried. the lab on that one. We uh, won't have that planned until four minutes before it uh, records. If you have any ideas, you can hit us up on uh, X, the platform formerly known as Twitter. I'm so and, glad you're saying that now. <laughs> <laughs> so check that out. Check out Denny's stuff. Check out my stuff. I'm Pat. We'll be back on Thursday. <laughs>